Today I'll be reviewing the Macintosh MHA200. This is one of the Macintosh cheapest amplifier purely for headphones. And I want to share with you my thoughts on this. So without wasting any further time, you know, uh, let me bring you through this amplifier from the physical perspective. Then I'll talk a little bit about the sound quality after that. Now, the Macintosh MHA200 is a very simple headphone amplifier. It has, uh, I can see in front here, a few outputs. Then there are some settings and buttons you can press here. And if you turn all the way to the back, which I have to be careful because of the cable, this is uh, input, one XLR input, one RCA input, and then there is the power cable. Now the power cable is a two pin connector that is a bit unusual for amplifier, but you know, this is what Macintosh gives. So this M is very well made. You can see it's made of metal, steel, and then this is transformer. The tubes are here. They do glow. I'll show you later. Uh, there is some lights there. Uh, they, Macintosh did provide this cage that you can actually put over the tubes to protect them. Personally, I put a cage on because I just don't want anything or whatever touching the tubes unnecessarily. Well, uh, that's really about it for the physical aspect. This M is actually quite heavy. I believe it's like a few kgs. I'm not sure. sure. Let me take out my wing scale yeah mine is the winding type i don't know why i got this but it's cool and then let me put on to the scale oh it's uh more than five kgs <laughs> my scale kind of weighs it's, it's quite heavy here now the exact weight i'll probably put down in the uh, screen below here, but you know that this is actually pretty, pretty heavy, at least more than 5 kg that my skill could measure. Now, this M has a very interesting characteristics, and that is, if you see the front panel here, this is the impedance knob, then there is uh, one of these lights here, this is a red light, you notice, a button, and then the volume. Now, unlike other amplifiers, owning the amplifier will off the light as such. Once you on it, it will off the light and then you'll power on the lights on the amplifier itself, which is on the tubes. As you can see here. Now, the tubes are obviously heating up. You can see it will blink for a few seconds. And once it stops blinking, it will be, I would say, as good enough to use. Based on my experience, you need to wait a little bit while more while the tubes actually get hot enough uh, and it works at its optimal level, you know. If not, the volume is a bit weird, that's what I'll say, weird. Once it's heat up, you can enjoy the music from the MHA 200 and I will tell you that the sound quality is very enjoyable. But before that, let's talk a little bit more of, of the other things first. Now you can see here, there are a few ports. There is one stereo jack here. This is the stereo jack. And then there's a four pin XLR. And then there's two times three pin XLR. So these three ports here, or should I say two, one and a pair, both are balanced ports. So you do get whatever power this M is supposed to deliver. And then there is a stereo port. Now this M, based on specification, delivers 500 milliwatts of power into multiple ohm settings, be it 32, 100, 250, 600, it delivers 500 milliwatt regardless of its uh, impedance itself. So this is quite interesting. I mean, uh, there is a knob here that you can turn. So if I turn to the right, or should I say, you know, uh, let me say uh, counterclockwise, yes. If I turn counterclockwise, it reduces the settings and then I turn clockwise, it increases the setting. What it means is that this is like 32, this is 100, 250, 600, and it does sound louder. Based on my own personal testing, as you increase it, if you are using some very low impedance headphone, it does sound louder, but a bit more mushy. Uh, based on recommendation by Macintosh, you should set it based on you know your headphone's impedance setting. So in the case of a HD 650 here, you should set it at about 250. And if you do something like say the Abyss, and then and the Abyss is here. In that case, it should be about the lowest, which is 32. Now, if you turn to the back, right, there is the XLR inputs. And then there is the RCA inputs. Now this is my own custom cable. Uh, I purchased it 
for this particular amplifier. This is a bit abnormal. Normally, most of the amplifiers uses the three pin type with the grounding. This amplifier, even though it's made of metal, doesn't have a grounding there. I don't think it's a cause for concern. I guess that uh, Macintosh probably designed amps enough to know what is safe, and I guess this is probably safe to them. But yeah, I got a nicer cable and it doesn't cost too much if you custom it yourself. But if you were to buy some you know, proper named ones, it will be pretty costly. Now for the tubes here, these are, let me see here. This is the 12AT7 and then there is the 12BH7. Now this is the two 12AT7s and these are the two 12BH7s. Right, you can roll the tube. These are the preamps, and this is the output tube based on my understanding. And uh, I did change the preamp tubes to the Mulat tubes. Uh, I personally think this gives, I guess, a little bit more accuracy. Um, and the original ones from um, Macintosh is a bit more, I would say, warm and thick, slightly, just very slightly. Personally, I think the difference are very small and you'll probably be more than happy not to even change the tubes at all. So that is something to note. Now, there is one issue with the amplifier and that is the volume knob here. Now, the volume knob is really interesting. I mean, there is a detent. You can hear the sound. There is a detent at the 12 o'clock mark here. So if I was to anyhow spin and then I feel it, there is a detent there. Now the thing is at 12 o'clock mark, it is very soft. If you're using a standard balance input, which is about 4 volts, 3.9 volts, uh, it is very, very soft. In fact, I was using my you know M17 here with a balance output, so I do connect it through like something like this with a balance output cable into the amplifier. Now, even with that setting, this is 3.9 volts if you're using line out. If I don't use the line out and I just you know switch it normally, it does go louder. But even then, I feel that it's a bit too soft to be set at the 12 o'clock or at a detent point. If you are using a normal, I would say as a very normal deck that outputs 4 volts on balance, you probably need to shift it to 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock to be, I would say, as loud enough. Now, Based on a lot of discussion online, this volume knob is quite um, irritating because most of the volume that is usable is between 12 to 2. Anything beyond 2 is probably too loud if you're using a balanced line in. And anything below 12 is just too soft. Which begs the question of why Macintosh decided to create a volume knob like this. Now, based on this, some of its uh, very, I would say, hardcore supporters and also uh, some of the distributors, they say that it's designed this way because it's meant to be controlled through the input from a preamp. So supposedly this amp takes up to 8 volts in if you want to. And if you are doing 8 volts in, yes, then you can probably leave it at 12 o'clock and it is pretty loud. And you can probably, you know, if you can change your deck output, something like a Cord Hugo TT, which goes up to 5.8 volts if you're using the older Hugo TT, and uh, my version was is currently in repair. Hopefully when it comes back, I'll get a better sound and test it out. But for now, I'm using the M17, which seems to output slightly more than four if you're not using the line out mode. And it does work, so I'm not gonna complain for now. I do prefer to control the volume using my M17. Uh, M17 has a line out mode, then you can use volume controls. Now, I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's not a true line out, but it still sounds better than using the M17 directly. So I won't complain too much on that. Now, when my Hugo TT does come in, I'll be more than willing to test it out and that I believe goes even higher. And hopefully maybe I can really leave it at 12 o'clock. But at least for now, I think you have to leave it at one o'clock or two o'clock if you are using an adjustable deck. If you're not using an adjustable deck, most likely your usable volume is from 12 to two, which is a very, very small gap. Uh, you probably need to really hold this down and turn extremely slowly. And that's about it for the physical and controls. Uh, you can off it through the button and really that's about it. There is nothing much to this amplifier when it comes to at least controls or the physical aspect. It's just very nice, very well built, looks great on the table. Without wasting any time, let's talk about sound quality. Sound quality of this amp, I would say is it's uh, different 
from the traditional solid state amps you get and also definitely different from the cheaper tube amps you get and it is at least I feel similar to high-end tube amps that I heard before. Now, this is my first tube amp that I purchased. I have to really make this disclaimer. I did not purchase many tube amps in my lifetime. Uh, I do have something of a half-half cheap China tube amp. I don't count that because that sounds really bad. But this is probably my first proper branded tube amp for headphones usage. Now, that being said, I have heard before others such as the WA-22. I do have one long, long ago. Oh, actually, in fact, that was the first one I purchased, but I kept it for a year. And I also purchased before the WA-8. And I have used before the WA-5LE. I also looked at Kain amps and tested it before once for the tube amp. I believe that's a 300 series. And then there is the MHA-200. So I think I have used quite a bit of tube amps and uh, I would say as this MHA 200 is different from the, I would say as WA 22 types. It's more closer to something like the WA 5 LE. That's probably how I put it. I can't really remember the Kain 300 because that's like a year or two ago. So how do I describe the sound, right? Now, many of us use solid states and solid state amps are accurate, precise, punchy, fast. That's how you describe it. And the opposite for tube amps, normally very warm, lush, uh, sometimes a bit thick. And then for the bass, a bit, I would say as uh, more bloomy. That's how I, I will you know, explain for especially the WA-22s. It, it feels very, yeah, bloomy. That's how I really would describe but for this MHA-200, it straddles between both the solid states and the tube amps and gets somewhere in between on a higher level. So for solid state amps, I use before the GSX Mini. I also have the A70 Pro I use before the Burson. Uh, I do own the first two, I said. Uh, Burson, I tried in the shop for like a good two hours. So I kind of have, uh, I would say, as a good feel of uh, expensive amplifier, but not the absolute top amp, not the 5,000, 10,000. I also used before the Holo Audio Bliss, I believe. That's the one. But the MHA 200 is outright different. Firstly, the sound stage is bigger, you know, compared to all the solid states that M I tried. You can hear it immediately. There is almost no debate on that. At least that's really how I feel after testing a lot of headphones like the HD 650. This is this. This is the Solar 30. I also have the Abyss. And then this is the Stealth from DCA. All of them showcase that these have a bigger sound stage, especially something like if I hear a song like Suzume where the voice is very light. On this M, it sounds humongously huge and really smooth and enjoyable. Sound stage on this M is definitely bigger. I can close my eyes and try to measure the stage. Uh, it always is bigger on this amplifier. Now, when it comes to, uh, I'll say as transient response, I find that this amp, uh, it's not as fast as the best of solid state. So at least if you compare to like say the GSX Mini, uh, not as fast as that, but not really much slower. I just feel like you know, a touch, a touch slower. It's like between using a cord product and other decks, kind of sound, kind of feel, you know, the cord products always feel a slightly faster, like it transients better. I, I just how I explain it, right? And then when it comes to the details of this M, this M has a lot of details. I find that I don't lose any details comparing this to other amplifiers. But just to note, this M does have certain biasness, or, or should I say, it sounds bigger on the mids, especially, especially the mids. And on the highs, it just feels a touch, a touch lesser, like slightly more rollout or something like that. So when it comes to details, if it's in the mids, the lows, I say the texture of the bass is there. But when it comes to the highs, sometimes you have to focus to really find them. So this is not outright in your face style details, but it is there. Um, however, you're not looking for it, you may not find it. So it's not right 
I'll say that this is probably not an outright detailed monster that will expose every single floor, especially on the treble, on the highs range. Then, in terms of tonality, this is slightly on the touch of warm side. It has It is slightly thicker, slightly warmer, uh, slightly more full sounding compared to Solid State Amps that I've tried, as I said, the Burson, the GSX, and then of course the A70 from Toping, right? Uh, and then lastly, when it comes to, uh, say, as timbre, it sounds pretty accurate to me. I don't think it's the most accurate sounding amp, but you know, it gives a very nice presentation. It feels like a big hall uh, with a lot of, I guess, wood to, you know, nicely diffuse the sound in this warm feel of a very, very large hall in most headphones I listen to on this amplifier. That's how I would describe it. Now, that is a description of general feel of the sound. Now, in the lows, I would say as, uh, there is some roundness in the bass impact. So if you're looking for the highest impact sound with very quick transient, I think the impact is there, but it is not like, absolute clean cut kind of impact. Uh, those, I say the solid state amps does better. You can hear it immediately. Uh, with this amp, it feels slightly rounded. But it does feel natural. That's the thing. It, it feels like really nice, natural bass lamp. Not the very artificial at times where it feels like bloop kind of sound on solid state amps that transients really quickly. Uh, I guess this is a personal preference, so... I shall not dive too deep into that. Now, when it comes to the very low bass, where the rumbles are there, I think this amp does carry very well. You can feel the rumble of the bass. It's very nice. I mean, I hear ba I hear songs from Yoa Sobi, uh, Yoa Sobi songs. Uh, the latest one, The Brave, has a lot of these very, very low bass rumbles. Sounds damn good there. And then I hear something like uh, Suzume. There is areas where the bass come in. The impact slams are really nice. Uh, then there is something like uh, one of the cyberpunk songs. Those very fast, quick basses, you can then, you can really hear the roundness, but the very natural, smooth, impactful, and then still have the nice low basses there. It's really nice. I'll say uh, the bass, to me, feels good for this amplifier. Now, when it comes to the mids itself, uh, I'll say as generally, I think they are pushed slightly more forward. It feels more apparent, more... Uh, I would say as a, you notice it more in the song. So maybe there's a slight increase in the mids. Now the mids also feel diffused. So uh, I would say as if you use any of the good solid state amp, it has a very, very nice focus. And the better ones have the focus plus a nice diffusion. This one, there is still focus, but the focus is really not as tight as any of the solid state amps. It feels big really really huge and diffuses really really wide like significantly wider and this makes certain headphone sounds a lot better this makes certain headphone sounds too big um, that you kind of can get lost in them but this is the effect and i get out of it i do enjoy it especially with certain headphones and if you notice on the table the headphones i have it kind of you know respond to the nice big diffuse meets really well uh, the mids are also very smooth, slight touch of warmness, very nice and I'll say as enjoyable to listen. It's one of the more enjoyable mids. Really like body is there, warmness is there, slight thickness to this. It's like smooth, diffuse, big. It sometimes, I would say, can swallow me up in certain headphones, like the Abyss, a bit too much for that headphone. Yeah, but the, the mids is fantastic here. Now, the highs, as I touched on earlier, feels slightly, slightly roll off, or I don't know, slightly behind. It feels slightly softer. Details are there, but it doesn't sparkle that much. Um, if you are into the highs, uh, probably not the M for you. If you are really, really into the very, very highs and you want that kind of ding, 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 sparkles at the top, not the M for you. Really not the M for you. 
At least that's how I feel. That's how I feel from listening a lot of uh, Japanese uh, pop songs. I mean, I love all the Yuasobi songs, the Edo songs, uh, some of the Final Fantasy songs, um, especially the Final Fantasy fourteen series of orchestra songs. I do listen to them a lot on this M and other M's. It's just, you know, on the highs, I think this M, not the most sparkly, not the most enjoyable if you are into those. So if you are listening to full orchestras with a lot of these highs and you love to enjoy and listen to them, maybe not for you. That's how I feel. But that's really how I describe the sound of this M itself. Soundstage is definitely bigger. Bass is very nice, very textured, but not ultra quick and snappy. It's just feels very organic, the bass. Nice and, I wouldn't say smooth, you know, I wouldn't say like terribly sloppy. It's just tight enough and very natural sounding when the bass hits down for this amplifier itself. And the low basses are very nicely textured, regardless of headphones I use. And then when it comes to the mids, really big, slightly more diffuse than most other solid state amps, especially, surrounds you, big, big sound there and you will really enjoy it if you like the kind of sound. I really love it for female vocals because it adds that slight more body. Um, uh, if I hear something from one of my friends, Ari Anjo, or I hear something from say, uh, You Are Sobi, or I think, I've forgotten, Suzume, I've forgotten what's the singer name. She had, the, the Japanese version has a very light, big sound, sounds damn great on this. It makes the sound super huge, her voice super, super large. And yeah, the highs are not the most exciting things. So these are the various sound qualities of this M that I listen to. That is very consistent across the headphones I use. So the thing is, what headphones did I use to play with this M, right? I use this HD650, I use the Solar 30, I use the Stealth, the Abyss, Diana T, this is, no, this is Diana Phi. And then, of course, I got the Abyss, and I also tried with the M50 for Audio Technica. Really affordable one. And I also tried with something like um, IEM. That one, I believe, that is the Evo from Etimotics. Now, that being said, the, this M, right, if you connect it properly to your player, and um, make sure that the player is, of course, active, this M has no hissing. Uh, even with the IEM. Now, the IEM is not like super sensitive, so I don't count it as a good measurement of its, I would say, as um, noise quality, noise floor. I think I will probably need a more sensitive IEM to try out in the future. But at least on all the headphones I use, at the 2 o'clock point, I do not hear any hiss if properly connected to my M17 uh, and ensuring that you know, the connection is there. Now, with all these headphones here, I will say that for the Abyss, I don't quite outright enjoy it the most. I think it still sounds damn good on this M, but I think you could get better qualities out of a good solid state M for the Abyss. It sounds lighter and bigger and really fast and impactful there. And that's what I want out of my Abyss, at least for me. Now, for the rest of the headphones, I feel that they benefit quite a bit on this. The Abyss has a very big sound stage already, so it doesn't need any enlargement. And it's not going to increase your enjoyment there. At least that's how I feel. Uh, but you want really a fast impact, the strong power there. And I think the Abyss really is better with the good solid state amps. But with the other headphones here, I find this amp pretty makes most of my headphones enjoyable. In fact, the greatest improvement is to this particular headphone here, the Solitaire T. Now, the Solitaire T has a major issue, and that is the sound station is really tiny, like squeeze in the head. With this M, it enlarges the sound stage, and it adds that you know, nice texture to the bass. This headphone has good bass, like really, really good, strong bass. But now you add the texture, the feel, the quality to it, I, I think the Solitaire T improves significantly with this amplifier here. And the Solar T has more than enough travel energy. Plug into here, well, slight reduction. Still has a lot of travel energy. Still very enjoyable. Now, the HG650 here is a very nice headphone to pair with it. 
it does increase the smoothness while still have a bit more body to the sound. The meats are really fantastic on this, but I don't think it gains as much as the Solitaire T. And uh, well, this guy here doesn't have some of the most nice highs to start with. Uh, at least I feel, you know, there are headphones with nicer highs. Uh, and with this M, I feel at times, for certain things, it may be a little bit too dull for the highs. However, that being said, it has a lot of nice, great meats combined with this M. It is really good meats. Like, some of the best meats you can ever hear of headphones. Pretty much. And I enjoy it a lot for the meats itself. And if you are into the meats, into vocals, you want strong power, big sound, this combination may work out for you. Now, with the stealth, which is a very nice balance, everything can uh, hear kind of headphones. Great combination. The bass, you know, I would say as with the low bass quality, the texture, you can easily hear it with the stealth. Uh, that being said, because the stealth doesn't have the most impactful bass to start with, with this M, it does reduce the impact slightly more. And that, um, if you are a bass head, you want that nice hard impact bass, maybe not for you, maybe not for you, this combination. But for me, I do enjoy it. I like the texture at the bass. I like the natural soundingness, you know. Uh, this combination is really good. And the stealth, even though it's supposed to be one of the most natural sounding close back, it's still not as big and wide compared to many other headphones out there. With this amplifier, it does increase the wideness of the sound, makes it enjoyable. Now, uh, a little bit on planners. Uh, this M is rated to be 500 milliwatt, then you'll reach a distortion of like 0.5 THD. Um, to start with, most of the time, if you listen to music, unless you listen really, really, really loud, uh, 500 milliwatt is actually enough. Uh, so for me, I'm actually a low volume listener. I can even listen to Stealth on the M17 without the power cable and I still can enjoy it. So I listen it at, I think, what, 80 points of volume out of 110 or 120, I've forgotten on the, let me see. I believe this goes up to, yeah, 120. So I listen to, I remember always 80 and 90. So it's very, very low volume listening. I think maybe a 70 decibel. So to me, this M has more than enough headrooms to enjoy the music for me, especially the stealth. Because the stealth is a closed can. I don't really think I feel, uh, or should I say, I don't really think I need any more volume to improve my listening experience. I mean, some people like to listen at 100 decibel. I don't know why. That will literally cause deafness. But to me, 70 something decibel is just nice. When I try it with my speakers, I tend to listen at about 75 decibels or even lower, maybe 70 to, to 70 to 75. Quite low listening for me. Now, with the Diana Fee, uh, I think I like this combination. Um, it's enjoyable. Um, how do I put it? The Diana Fee is a very exciting headphone, sometimes too exciting for its own good to me. And with this combination, I find it's, uh, it, it reduces the excitement slightly, just slightly reduces the excitement, but it makes it so much nicer in the mids, so much smoother, and Diana Fee doesn't have like a huge sound stage, it just feels really open, but not a huge sound stage. But the combination with this, it has a very now, nice, big sound, yet, you know, because it's originally a very exciting headphone, the slight reduction in excitement just makes it a lot more pleasant to listen on the long run. So that's really how I feel about it. I think this combination can work out for people who wants that kind of sound. A slightly less, I'll say as not top of the uh, craziness, excitement on the original fee. A slight reduction in that, but for a bigger sound, a smoother sound, and most importantly, a bass that you can feel out of the Diana fee. And a beast is known for having very nice bass. A very unique bass and with the combination like this you really can hear that unique bass so as you can see the MH200 is definitely good for certain genres especially if you focus on the mids a lot with some bass emphasis I think it's a fantastic M if you're going for something with a sparkly high treble or a lot of a lot of a lot of energy this M may not be for you this M feels powerful feels full at least full enough for me uh, but it's never too warm too thick that you know, some of the other 
Tube M's from like WA22 feels like. So it is really straddling between the high ends like the WA5 LE, which I feel is like a top end solid state with a hint, a good hint of tubeness. This guy has a bit more tubeness, but you know, overall it's very enjoyable in most aspects and I really, really like it. And it does power all my headphones, at least those that you see here, to a level, to me, that is good. Now, I'm definitely a lower volume listener than most, but I think you can slightly increase the volume another five decibels and I don't think there's any issues here. Now, if you are a very, very loud listener, I'm not too sure, 500 milliwatt may not be enough, especially if you are using very inefficient planars like the Abyss here. This guy here, if you're running 100 decibels, by right, they need like one watt of power. So I'm not too sure whether this will actually provide you that. Or it may provide you that, but with a lot more distortion that you may not be able to feel due to the tube-like architecture that it deploys here. Now this M, one of the interesting part is that it consumes a lot of power. It consumes, I believe, about 40 watt of power, 35 to 40 watt of power out of your socket. Now that is insignificant to the total energy used in a home. Easily one hour aircon consumes more power than this by I think 20, 30 times. So don't worry about it too much. You know, it does consume more power than some of my other headphone amps, but definitely uh, nothing to worry on uh, compared to, I would say, speaker tube amps. I think speaker tube amps are crazy. They consume tons and tons of power. And that's about it for my review of the MHA 200 from uh, Macintosh. Fantastic M. If you like the sound, this is for you. If you don't like the sound, you don't like the warmness, the thickness, even though it's everything is just slightly more than a solid state M, it's there, it's apparent, you can tell that this is a tube M. If you don't like the sound, this is not the M for you. But overall, as a package, I think it's fantastic. Really fantastic. Now, the one last thing, what's the price of this M, right? Now, if you buy in the US, it's 2,500 USD, and then you pay tax and shipping according to where you are. Uh, in Singapore, you buy for about anywhere from 3,005 to 4,004, depending on where you buy it, how you buy it, what is your negotiation techniques and warranty limits and stuff. But yeah, the price does have a huge range in Singapore for the MHA 200 here. Uh, you can easily pick it up from certain vendors, at a slightly higher price, but you can get it quite easily. It's not too hard, not too rare here. Overall, I think I enjoy this amp a lot, and I hope this review helps you to understand what's in this amplifier. That's about it. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.